Welcome to podcast number seven of Machine Civilization. This is Clayton Barnett speaking on their behalf. Drawing from what we discussed last week, dealing with the listener question of what might have been the result if some of the machines had been coded in China, I wanted to broaden that a little bit this time and talk about the international politics in which the humans, one, two, three generations from now in my future history, find themselves, because it's a world we would recognize some of, but also would be very different to people from our current time. As always, spoilers abound, as I'll be talking about not only existing books, but projects that are currently under development, so let the buyer beware. To discuss the international politics, there are four fundamental categories, and we'll be looking at countries in each of them. There are failed states, floundering states, the Polar Alliance, and then just any other small nation states. The two biggest failed states are the United States and the nations of Western Europe. As is dealt with in several of my books, the United States first suffered an economic implosion as a result of the Russians, Chinese, and Indians rolling out a new currency called the RIA, backed by gold and indexed oil, at which point the U.S. dollar became worthless. When that happened, the U.S. economy ground to a halt, and any city is three meals away from a riot, and any country is three days away from a revolution. And within one week, the United States essentially disintegrated. The fact that it was just as riven by the same political divides and the problems of diversity that we have now simply exacerbated the problem. For Western Europe, I assume their current course of staying with the socialist economy and importing millions of barbarians from the Middle East and North Africa continues until eventually the money runs out and the lights go off and the Islamists are simply too stupid to know how to fix them and turn them back on. That does not happen in Central Europe for a reason which we'll come to when we get to the Polar Alliance. The other cluster of failed states would, of course, be Sub-Saharan Africa, because without their trading partners in the north of Western Europe and America, and more importantly, a constant stream of billions of dollars flowing in their direction to keep their tin-pot dictatorships propped up and the food coming, all of those countries fail spectacularly and they probably start eating each other. This has ramifications when we get to discussing the condition of China. Of the floundering states, China is the first one, because with Western Europe and America imploded, their trade would fall off dramatically meaning their standard of living of all those people making radios and Nikes suddenly ends, and they stand on a precipice of a revolution. Coupled with that, like most modern nations, they face a demographic problem. They, yes, do have one point something billion people, but they're aging fast, just like in Japan. However, not only are they aging fast, China also has the worst male-to-female ratio of anywhere in the world, due to their culture coupled with the Communist Party's insane one-child policy. So they simply cannot reboot their demographics because they don't have enough women. That's their policy, and they're screwed with it. Also, as I did mention, since I was discussing China in podcast number six, is their neo-colonial experiment in Africa to extract wealth collapses simply because the Africans aren't eating. There's no money flowing to them, and the Chinese don't have enough money to step in where Western Europe and America used to be. So falling trade, aging demographics, frightful male-female imbalance, and their neo-colonial experiment has them floundering, but they're not dead yet. To the north of former America is Canada, which, once they realized they had to start shooting American refugees fleeing the breakup of the U.S., were able to stabilize their country. In fact, the novel I am writing right now discusses how Canada has in fact expanded into the old U.S. US Midwest and calling it Lower Canada. Their winter capital is in what used to be Fort Wayne and now is called Trudeau. As one of the characters says, they had no choice. 
because it's stipulated in my future history that there is a Maunder minimum, which is a global cooling. No one seems to know if it is a actual ice age or just another little ice age, which existed in the Northern Hemisphere for most of the Middle Ages up to about the 17th or 18th century. As one of the characters said, you can stand atop one of the skyscrapers in Toronto and look north with your binoculars at the line of white. And every year, it never melts in the summer, and it comes a little bit closer in the winter. So, with their country potentially under ice, they had to move south. Whether or not they can hold their country together under this neo-imperial policy, I'm not sure. They certainly do exist almost three generations on after the breakup in the book that I'm writing now. But another character says that you've got the ice behind them, you've got Faustina's Imperium before them, and you've got the Russians next to them, who crossed over the Bering Strait and have seized not only Alaska, but also British Columbia. In fact, the Russians and the Canadians have fought a couple of minor battles in Alberta and Saskatchewan. So that's putting tremendous pressure on our friends to the north, and we'll just have to see how they hold up. Other floundering states would pretty much be all of South America. I have not been shown anything of how they're doing. Obviously, their trade with uh, North America initially drops to zero. Once the North Americans get their feet back on the ground, perhaps that trade revives. But I really don't know. Parts of Brazil and Chile and Argentina are perfectly functioning countries. It's entirely possible that they take a hit in their quality of life, but maybe they're doing fine. I, I have no idea, and we'll have to find out. Just south of the former U.S. is Mexico, and considering that Mexico's a floundering, semi-failed state right now, while they do occupy half of former New Mexico, Arizona, and Southern California, certainly up to San Diego and parts north, they're still, just like now, dealing with their constant problems with the narcos, even though they don't have any customers up north anymore. They don't have any remittance flowing back from all the Mexican workers in the U.S. because there's no jobs. And they also can't sell oil to the Americans anymore because the economy's imploded. So I think, from what I've seen, Mexico, in a fashion, hangs together, but it's by a threat. That brings us to the countries who are succeeding and are in what are called the Polar Alliance. Japan, Russia, the Empire, and the Imperium. Japan was able to begin to turn themselves around right when America was imploding, as is discussed in the prologue to Friend and Ally. Their brand new empress, who filched the throne out from under her cousin, made a lot of sweeping constitutional changes and harangued her people to start having more children, leading by example, I think she ended up with 12 children, to turn their demographic implosion around. Plus, Japan had a clear lead in the development of the machines, both the AIs, such as Tribe Tosca, and the sentient androids from Somi Corporation. Above that, the idea of reactionless motors, which is playing a increasing role, technological role, as my stories move further into the future. It was an idea developed in America, experimented in by China, but the Japanese were able to bring it into production. A reactionless motor is a cheap and easy way to not only move around on this planet, but off this planet, and would absolutely revolutionize planetary trade, and interplanetary trade and exploration to the point where other members of the Polar Alliance, three generations from now, are beginning to terraform Mars. The second I mentioned was Russia. Also, more demographic problems with Western Europe cratered. Who are they going to sell their oil to? Well, they start selling it to the Visegrad Four, who we'll discuss next, but also as Russia is helped by their development of machines in St. Petersburg, tribe Mandrovich who, at least some of them, as I said in the last episode, are very nationalistic and are very interested in protecting and helping the Russian people. And they reform the political system, dredge up what's left of the Romanov family, and pop them back onto the throne. 
encourage demographic reform, encourage economic reform, and are able to negotiate with the Japanese to de begin developing their own reactionless motors as well, giving them access to the stars. The Visegrad group, which exists today, is Central Europe. It is a political and economic alliance between Poland, Czech Republic, Slovakia, and Hungary. They, while also part of the European Union, resist interference in their internal systems. For example, Poland and Hungary do not agree with the EU stipulations about faggotry. After seeing what happens to Western Europe, they also end all outside immigration, and then with the implosion of Western Europe, realizing that they needed more than just this alliance on paper between their peoples, they go back and find a Habsburg, and he becomes the titular ruler of, technically, it's called the Imperial Danubian Federation, but most people just refer to it as the Empire. And besides the four countries of Visegrad, it later comes to include Croatia, Slovenia, and parts of northern Italy, and is in discussions with an autonomous zone of former Transylvania in western Romania. The fourth is the Imperium, which is Faustina's empire created in the old American Deep South. That's explained in my most recent trilogy, the American Imperium trilogy of Princess Crusade, Empress Crusade, Goddess Crusade, and almost single-handedly, this young woman raises an army, first takes port city of Savannah off the Chinese communists, and then proceeds to reconquer all the Old South, bringing it under her personal control. In later, we see some areas such as central Arkansas and former Kentucky brought under her control as well, and there's an allusion to a punitive campaign through the old Acela Corridor up to New York and Boston, although Boston's been destroyed, to link up with the Northern Federation, who I'll mention in a little bit toward the end. Also, we'll know, spoiler again, that in the third book of the trilogy, Goddess Crusade, through a series of happenstance, Faustina is handed a stolen copy of the plans for a reactionless motor, giving the Imperium access to anywhere in the world in minutes, as well as off-planet, which makes a huge economic impact. Although not technically part of the Polar Alliance, but sort of given affiliate or auxiliary status right now, Australia has survived as well. At one point early in Princess Crusade, it's discussed that the fission reactors around Oak Ridge and a few other places are running out of uranium. And besides Texas, the, one of the only other sources for processed fuel is Australia. So obviously they've survived in some capacity. And I do know that they have sort of been offered this affiliate status within the Polar Alliance, but nothing's formal. So the Aussies survived, and I'm pleased with that. Good on you. Others would be things that have been mentioned in passing, with the exception of the Republic of Texas. That nation has played a very large role in several of my novels, four of them to be precise, and in fact plays a part in the manuscript I'm writing now. Texas in and of itself is the, what we would regard the current state, as well as all of eastern New Mexico and Oklahoma, parts of Louisiana, and they have influence over most of what was Kansas, Missouri, and the front range of Colorado. The Northern Federation, which I mentioned a little bit ago, consists of primarily Maine and New Hampshire, who early on broke away from what was the failing United States and set up shop on their own, later to include parts of Vermont and parts of Massachusetts outside of Boston, because Boston... I don't know the details, but it was a scene of some extremely bad in-city Civil War fighting, and the entire city's pretty much burned out and gone. But they're up north, off on their own. They're going to be facing some of the same problems the Canadians are, though, as things get colder. It will help that they're all facing the Atlantic Ocean, and the Gulf Stream is running right past them. That may keep them warm enough that they're not covered in snow and ice. I'll just have to find out. The only two places in the United States that get a passing mention, well, one more than the other, 
is Desiree, which used to be what we would call Utah, 